Today on Beers TV, we're going to share our most detailed video on Kelkwasser. Hi guys, my name is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the Beer S160, where every week we do our best to help you guys, members of the reefing community, enjoy your tanks and find new ways to explore the hobby. We do that by following the setup and progression of this 160 gallon reef tank. In last week's episode, we covered in detail why we need to maintain calcium and alkalinity levels in the reef tank and all the benefits associated with that. This week, we're going to explore our first method of replacing that calcium and carbonate alkalinity consumed by corals with Kelkwasser. Kelkwasser is probably my personal favorite calcium and alkalinity solution because it's one of the lowest cost, in some ways the easiest to implement, one of the only long-term solutions for maintaining an elevated pH near 8.3, and perfectly suitable for all but the heaviest demand tanks. We're going to share the basics and some of the science behind Kelkwasser, the benefits and drawbacks, the three primary methods of incorporating Kelkwasser into your reef tank, and finish with what a potential installation would look like for the Beer S160. Before we get too deep into this, at the most basic level, Kelkwasser is just a powder you dissolve into fresh water and slowly drip into the tank to add calcium and alkalinity for your corals. There's also a side benefit of elevating the pH most reefers appreciate. Kelkwasser is really simple to implement because for the most part, you just drip a small container of Kelkwasser solution into your tank every day or add some Kelkwasser powder to your auto top off reservoir and call it a day. Like most reefing methods, you don't really need to understand the science behind what you're doing when you're adding products like this, so don't get too intimidated if you don't catch all of this in the first pass. But if you can at least get a high level understanding, it makes it a lot easier to implement and adjust to your needs. All the products out there labeled as Kelkwasser in the reefing industry are just a container of calcium hydroxide powder. Calcium hydroxide is the only additive in our market that can provide calcium and alkalinity in a single additive or solution to the degree that's needed in the average reef tank. The reason for this is if I attempt to combine calcium and carbonate ions in a single concentrated bottle, they all precipitate out almost immediately and the product would more or less just become a bottle of water and silty sand which is pretty much useless. Kelkwasser or calcium hydroxide is different in the fact that it doesn't add carbonate to the water it's dissolved in. It adds calcium ions and hydroxide ions to the water. The calcium obviously raises the calcium levels in the tank, but what's interesting is how the hydroxide transforms into carbonate alkalinity once it's added to the tank. So when you add the Kelkwasser solution to the tank, the hydroxide interacts with the available carbon dioxide in the reef tank to form bicarbonate and carbonate alkalinity in the tank. So while you're not exactly adding bicarbonate or carbonate alkalinity directly to the tank, the net result after the hydroxide reacts with the carbon dioxide in the tank is the same. That concept is sometimes easier to understand in reverse when you grasp what calcium hydroxide is and how it's created. Calcium hydroxide is a result of heating calcium carbonate to the point that it releases all of its carbon dioxide and forms calcium oxide. They then add a small amount of water to form calcium hydroxide or as we refer to it, Kelkwasser. Knowing this, it's a bit easier to understand how the calcium hydroxide can utilize the carbon dioxide in the tank to not only add calcium, but also produce bicarbonate and carbonate for the corals so they can build it back into their calcium carbonate based skeletal structure. I mentioned the potential benefit of raising your pH earlier. This is more or less just a side effect of removing excess carbon dioxide from your tank. For a variety of reasons, most reef tanks have an excess amount of that carbon dioxide and related carbonic acid in the tank, preventing them from maintaining pHs closer to 8.3 that we would all like. We just finished covering when you dose the calcium hydroxide to the tank, the hydroxide combines with the carbon dioxide to form the bicarbonate alkalinity. This reduces the free carbon dioxide in the water and effectively reduces the formation of carbonic acid and helps you maintain higher pHs in your reef tank. Kelkwasser is one of the very few methods of raising the pH of your tank consistently and has the benefit of doing this while also keeping calcium and alkalinity in balance. I've seen endless successful tanks anywhere between 7.8 and 8.3 and for the most part my advice is don't worry about it as long as you're in that range. However, if you're adamant on maintaining 8.3, dosing Kelkwasser as your calcium and alkalinity solution is probably the best option. Overall, Kelkwasser has a handful of benefits which have made it one of the most popular options in our industry, starting with it's a single product with a balanced approach that by its very nature adds equal amounts of calcium and alkalinity in the same proportion that the tank typically consumes it in. The addition also has no effect on salinity and little effect on overall tank chemistry other than the elevation of pH which most reefers find valuable and on top of that it's both inexpensive to set up as well as to use. You can have a do-it-yourself Kelk tripper set up for less than 25 bucks if you wanted. 
One of the side benefits to calc is a high pH of the solution. It has a potential to precipitate out phosphate in the area it's dripped in. I wouldn't call this a total solution for phosphate control because the precipitate likely settles out in the sand and isn't a complete removal solution, but it is a commonly referred to advantage. I'm also going to throw in one anecdotal thing I've noticed over the years, and this might just be my experience, but my observation has been tanks running Kelkwasser seem to grow coralline algae a lot faster than other methods. This is likely just an effect of the elevated pH, which can be hard to maintain with other methods. Like everything, there are some drawbacks, however, biggest one being related to overdosing. It's super common to add kelk to your auto top off, and auto top offs fail all the time. In this case, it would overdose kelk to the tank and potentially cause serious issues if you're not around to correct them quickly. We'll cover a few ways to make sure that that doesn't happen in just a moment. Kelk is also a very caustic substance. You absolutely do not want to get in your eyes or breathe because it will burn you. You really want to try and keep it off your skin as well to prevent irritation or worse. A mask, eye protection, and gloves are probably a good idea, and you obviously want to keep this out of reach of children. Kelk Wasser also has some limitations with how much you can add in a day. Basically, you can't add more kelk solution than your tank evaporates in a day, or the tank's eventually going to overflow. Therefore, how much calcium and alkalinity you can add in a day with kelk is highly dependent on how much water your tank evaporates in a day. I'd say kelk wasser is likely suitable for a vast majority of mixed tanks, and even many SPS tanks with some thought. So there are three primary methods of adding kelk wasser to the tank, slowly dripping into the tank, adding it to your auto top off and reactors or stirrers. They all involve one thing, and that's dissolving the kelk water powder in fresh water, preferably something like RODI or distilled water, and letting it settle out. You start by mixing up a slurry of the kelk wasser powder in fresh water, typically anywhere from a half a teaspoon to a maximum of two teaspoons per gallon of water. You can add more than two teaspoons, but it won't dissolve and it'll just settle out. Once the solution is settled, there'll likely be some white undissolved powder on the bottom of the container and a clear solution above. This clear solution is often referred to as lime water or saturated kelk washer solution. This is what you want to dose to the tank. One of the main reasons that you don't dose that milky white kelk slurry that you get right after mixing is because you'd see a pretty rapid rise in the pH of the tank, which is obviously dangerous. Only dose that fairly clear solution after the excess kelk is settled out. The lowest cost and easiest solution for dosing kelk washer is dripping. With $10 of kelk, an empty bottle, and some tubing, you can have an effective method of dripping kelk into your tank. They're typically designed based on a siphon you start by blowing into one tube, which starts a gravity-based drip on the other tube. You also notice the tube doesn't quite reach the bottom, which allows the undissolved kelk and precipitates to settle out in the bottom. The dripper only draws clear fluid. Most reefers will make two of these, so you can make one in advance. Use yesterday's, which has already been settled out, and create one for tomorrow. Nice side effect of this is it can reduce the demand in replacing evaporated water as well. In fact, most reefers will try and size the container to be less, but somewhere in the neighborhood of what their tank evaporates in a day for this reason. If an ugly bottle on the top of your tank isn't acceptable, we do have some cool kits available called BRS Do-It-Yourself Kelk Washer Dripper Kits for building something a bit more attractive. More or less, it's just some Murloc Push Connect bulkheads you can attach to the lid of the container. Tubing goes in the top, and a rigid acrylic tube goes in the bottom, which makes it super easy to consistently draw just a couple inches off the bottom. We often use these OXO glass containers for this, but you could really use any container like a one gallon jug. How much kelk washer powder you add to the fresh water is somewhere between half a teaspoon and two teaspoons per gallon of water you dissolve it in. That obviously scales with the container you use, so if your dripping jug is only a quart, that'd be between an eighth a teaspoon and half teaspoon. As always, evaluate what's in your tank. If you only have a few corals, start on the low end. If you have a healthy stock tank, start a bit higher, but it's always wise to start low and work your way up until the levels stabilize around what your corals consume each day. Well, do-it-yourself drippers are probably the method most reefers try first with Kelkwasser. I'd say by far the most popular method of dosing Kelkwasser long-term is in conjunction with your auto top-off system. All you need to do is mix some Kelkwasser in with the fresh water in your top-off reservoir. The nature of an auto top-off system in evaporation is it replaces small amounts of water periodically throughout the day. Turns out this is also the ideal way to add calcium alkalinity, slow and stable with very minimal impacts to overall chemistry. I'm going to go on record and say I'd personally recommend a kelk washer based auto top off system to almost any new reefer because it solves a few major tasks with one system. Calcium, alkalinity, salinity, and pH are now almost effortless to maintain. It might not be quite as accurate as some other systems like two-part because evaporation may change to some degree with seasons, but simplicity and ease of understanding the system trumps that for me. 
My goal is to help the most people find success with their reef tank, and I think Kalkwasser based auto top off systems are going to do that for a vast majority of reefers out there. Since evaporation generally is pretty stable from day to day, it's likely you'll dose the same amount of saturated calc solution every day. That means controlling the amount of calcium and alkalinity added is just dependent on the amount of calc washer you dissolve in the reservoir. Again, typically anywhere between half a teaspoon and two teaspoons per gallon of water, meaning if you had a 10 gallon freshwater auto top off container, you would mix in anywhere between five and 20 total teaspoons in the container depending on demand. Start slow and work your way up. If you find yourself at the maximum of two teaspoons and your tank is still dropping calcium and alkalinity levels every day, you have a couple options starting with increasing the amount of evaporation by aiming a power head at the surface of the water, adding a fan across the surface of the water, or removing or venting your hood. There is of course a maximum amount of humidity that you want in your home, so that some of these things might not be an option. The other option is to add an acid like vinegar to the top off reservoir which allows you to dissolve more calc washer into the solution. This absolutely works and I know a lot of people I trust who have done this long term. However, it is a bit more complex and you're starting to deal with some unknowns because vinegar is a carbon source. It's going to impact the tank in other more complex ways, most of which are potentially positive, such as promoting nutrient control by feeding the bacteria. I have to say, if I reach the limits of what kelk washer can do for me with the maximum potency and realistic evaporation rates, I'm personally going to move on to a different solution that doesn't have the same limits, such as two-part or calcium reactors, but it's more of a preference than it is a hard, fast rule. Before we move on to kelk reactors, I'm going to say the number one issue people associate with kelk washer is overdosing and killing the tank because the pH skyrockets if your auto top off fails and suddenly adds 10 gallons of kelk washer solution in a day. I actually think it isn't the kelk washer that should get the bad rap for this, it's really the auto top offs because it isn't the kelk washer that's failing, it's your auto top off and system design. It's just the kelk washer in the top off solution compounds the issue if an auto top off fails. Here are a few ways to protect your tank. It's important that you use more than one for redundancy, but the more you add, the more protected your tank will be. It all starts off with a good auto top off you trust. The only one I use these days is the oscillator because it uses an electrical eye for the water level that doesn't have any moving parts. It has a backup float switch, audible failure alarm, internal shutoff timer if it's been on too long, as well as a lesser known feature inside the control box where you can control the speed of the pump to not only meet your dosing needs, but it also works in conjunction with the timer to reduce the chances of a serious overdose. Most importantly, in over a decade of using them with dozens of tanks, I've never had an oscillator fail me, nor have I actually ever seen it happen to anyone I know personally. That said, the Tunes oscillator isn't the lowest cost option out there, and options like the JBJ will absolutely work if you look at other safety features in conjunction. For example, it's important that the top off reservoir is always located below where the kelk enters the tank to prevent siphons when the pump turns off. If the water level of your top off reservoir is above the sump level where you dose the tank, it's going to siphon, so don't be surprised. You can also use a float valve on your sump for protection. Dosing pumps have a more controlled dose, known flow rates, and substantially lower risk of siphoning than normal pumps. You can also limit the size of your top off reservoir, so even if there was a failure, it would likely not have a devastating impact on the tank. However, one of the best ways to protect the tank from an auto top off kelk washer failure is a pH controller. If the HEO fails and starts to dump kelk solution in the tank, the pH is going to rise. All you need is a pH controller which can turn off the power to your ATO pump in that event. Milwaukee makes a pretty affordable controller, but honestly this is probably just the excuse you need to pick up a more fully featured controller with the Reef Keeper for something really affordable and simple for things like this, or Neptune Apex if you want the most feature rich advanced controller out there. You can also use a pH controller to close or open a solenoid which can shut off the flow of solution from your ATO. However, generally speaking, solenoids are less reliable and the heat they produce can cause precipitation from the kelk washer and cause them to get stuck open or closed. So solenoids are not my favorite option unless these considerations have been taken into account with the system design. One last note on the reservoir itself, it's important that you keep a lid on it. Carbon dioxide in the air will deplete the potency of the kelk washer solution, so you want to expose it to as little air as possible. You don't need to hermetically seal the container, any decent fitting lid will do. A white crust will also likely form on the top, which actually protects the potency, so leave it be. And for all these reasons, you only need to mix it once to get it fully saturated. Not only is there no need to mix it again later, mixing it will actually expose it to new carbon dioxide and deplete its potency. This is where kelk washer reactors come in. These are chambers which hold the kelk washer powder and flow water through them. What this will do is make sure the solution is always 100% saturated and as strong as it can be. Depending on how it's installed, it might also save on space and make 
maintenance for you as well. Personally, I think the reservoir is good enough and will keep the Kelk solution at max potency as long as you have a decent lid. But this is a cool option to ensure that and also fills the needs of the gear junkie in many of us. There are two main types of Kelk reactors, pump driven reactors and stirrers. I personally don't recommend the pump versions because you have to have a series of timers set up to mix it periodically and then provide time to settle out before it can be dosed to the tank. It's just unneeded complexity and risk. The stirrers work by slowly rotating a bar that constantly keeps it mixed at the bottom but moves slow enough that it allows the kelk to settle out. It's okay to mix it like this because there's very little carbon dioxide in the container to deplete the potency. Because it is mixing like this, you'll know the bottom is absolutely saturated to the max. The reactor will likely be hooked up to an auto top off system where you flow water from your freshwater reservoir through the reactor and then to the tank, but you could use a pump with a known flow rate like a reliable dosing pump and a timer. Either way, the system works by pumping the water through the bottom of the Kelk slurry where it exits the top and travels down to the tank. There are a few different brands and cost points. Two Little Fishes makes an entry level version. It's cool and works, but you might have trouble finding the right speed pump to pump water through it. Where well, the Kelk mixes properly, but slow enough that the milky Kelk slurry doesn't exit the top. I really only consider it an option for a pretty small tank. Aquamatic and Octopus make options where the stir bar is operated electronically with a motor and what I would suggest. Both work fine. The biggest issue is just the size of the reactor. Basically needs to be big enough that there's ample time for the kelk to settle out before the next time the top off or pump turns on. If you find that the slurry is reaching the top, I'd find a way to slow the flow down through the reactor. I'd say the smaller ones will probably work with most tanks up to around 90 to 120 gallons if the flow rate is fairly slow with an aqua lifter, slow dosing pump, or something tuned down to a similar flow rate. Larger than that, or with a faster flow pump, I'd recommend the larger Aquamedic 5000. I'd personally use a pH controller of some type with any Kelk reactor as well. I'm going to give this away and let you know that we're not going to go with Kelkwasser on the BRS-160. I was very close to using Kelkwasser on this system until we outgrew it, which would likely be a year or so from now, and then switching to two-part or a calcium reactor when needed. If this was going to be a mixed reef tank like most reef tanks out there, I think I would have gone with Kelkwasser because it probably would have been all this tank ever needed. The real deal breaker in this case was we already plumbed our RODI system directly to the sump for auto top off. We're really happy with how that was implemented. It's safe, effective, and we don't ever have to carry buckets of top off water around, which everyone hates. So this awesome top off solution is staying put. I can tell you if we were going to install Kelkwasser on this system, it would not surprisingly be a reservoir-based auto top-off system. I'd use a Toons Oscillator as our auto top-off solution, and I'd also use a Milwaukee pH controller to power off the Toons Oscillator if needed. But more likely, we'd use a controller like the Reef Keeper or Neptune Apex, which will be coming in the later series. I'd probably also use a float valve in the sump if possible as a third backup. I normally try and make my auto top up reservoir run one week's worth of water so I can fill it once a week. I'd be tempted to use one of these cool Norwesco containers, but they're too tall. Since the water level in the container is above the sump level, we'd have siphon issues. Basically, after the pump turned off, the water would continue to flow down due to gravity and the siphon effect. I try and find something similar but shorter and then put it on the ground below the sump. If you want something cool like this, check out Norwesco's website for a dealer in your area. Otherwise, a brute trash can from a big box hardware store will work great. I hope you were able to pick up at least one new thing related to Kelkwasser in your reef tank this week. If you did, let us know with a quick thumbs up and subscribe. If you have any questions, share them in the comments area down below, and someone from the reefing community or BRS will be glad to help. See you next week with episode 31, everything you ever wanted to know about two-part.